So today we're going to talk about different neurologic problems and how do we figure out where the lesion is and what is the lesion. So as we know that uh, people can present with weakness, numbness, tingling and all, that, uh, all kinds of symptoms um, and our job is to figure out where the lesion is. Uh, here for the purpose of discussion I have picked weakness as a symptom so a patient can come in with weakness in any one, any one part of the body and then we have to decide where the lesion is. Now remember first of all we have to figure out if the weakness is focal or generalized. So many times patients come in and they have weakness all over the body and they say they just can't move, they, have, they just are weak all over. Well in that case uh, more, more likely than not it is actually fatigue that you are dealing with. So make sure that you differentiate between the two problems. Um, if the patient has focal weakness then we uh, connect the, that focus of weakness to the site uh, in the nervous system where the lesion could be. In order to take history, we have we make sure that we ask precise questions and at least ask uh, these few questions. And I have the mnemonic here, odd lip. So we got to ask about onset and duration, which are very important. So there are some uh, problems where duration could be um, acute and there are some where patient may have chronic problem. So for example, if a patient says that the weakness just started uh, a couple of hours ago or a few a couple of days ago then it could be a stroke it could be a vascular event it could be a trauma or anything like that and long duration of weakness could be related to many ne neurologic problems for example uh, a tumor a, a lesion in the brain a, 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 a lymphoma and anything like that so make sure that you have a good sense of when the problem started the next would be location. So location is the most important uh, uh, element in history when it comes to weakness because this is how you connect uh, your uh, problem to the, um, location, the site of lesion in the brain or the peripheral nervous system. And we'll come to that in a second. Now the next would be uh, asking the patient if the weakness is intermittent or constant. So there are some central nervous or peripheral nervous system problems where patient may have uh, weakness off and on. So at times they're okay, other times they're not. So for example, um, my senior gravis patient can have intermittent weakness. Um, multiple sclerosis patients can have intermittent weakness and then it could be constant as well. Um, in many peripheral neuropathies and central nervous lesions, the weakness is going to be constant. The next would be uh, asking if a patient had such previous episodes. So multiple sclerosis is a classic example where the patient may have neurologic deficits sep separated by space and time. And that's how you actually make the diagnosis. Next would be important to find out if uh, what the patient's age and sex and demographic is because there are many problems that are more common in young versus old age groups and uh, female versus male patients. So this is the, the least amount of information we need to uh, gather when the patient comes in with a symptom of weakness or any neurologic problem. Next we move on to the exam which is very important in, important in neurologic system. So we check the tone and strength of the patient and we know that uh, hypertonicity is very common in upper motor neuron lesion and then it can be normal. The patient can also have hypotonicity or very low tone and that is common in lower motor neuron lesion. Then the strength is very important. So uh, you make sure that you actually check the strength of the muscle or the area of the body where the patient is complaining about weakness. So I have just for review a little snapshot here. So if there is no contraction in the muscle fibers then it is 0 out of 5. If the patient has some muscle flickering but no movement then it is 1 out of 5. If they have some movement uh, it's possible but they cannot move against gravity so it's in horizontal plane only then it is 2 out of 5. If they have some movement possible uh, against gravity but not against your resistance then it's 3 out of 5 and this is the most common uh, level of weakness that we see in patients. If they have some movement possible against some resistance but but you still beat them uh, then it is 4 out of 5 and if uh, you they can duke it out with you then it is uh, 5 out of 5 and they have normal strength. So after you have uh, gotten to this level we, uh, we of course check the bulk of the muscle also and then we go on to check the reflexes. So here we have um, ankle, knee, biceps, brachioradialis and triceps and I put them in the order, order from the bottom to the top because that's, this is how it's easy for me to remember. So S1, S2 is for corresponds to ankle. The nerve root L3, L4 correspond to knee and C5, 6 
to biceps brachioradialis and C7 and C8 correspond to triceps. So um, there's a little uh, form or, the, or little tip that you can remember in, if you want to memorize how these nerve roots correspond to these different reflexes. So remember one, two, tie my shoe, three, four, kick the door, five, six, pick the sticks, and seven, eight, shut the gate. Um, this is one easy way to remember these nerve roots corresponding to different reflexes, but if you don't want to remember this uh, little um, jargon, you can just remember the uh, nerve roots from bottom to the top. Anyhow, after you've checked the reflexes and you've decided that reflexes are normal or diminished or there is hyperreflexia, you move on to um, the analysis of the lesion. So uh, just for the purpose of review, I have a little uh, reflex arc here, so remember that this is how a reflex is generated. So if there is a, first there's going to be a stimulus on the skin or the muscle or, or the surface of the body. So that's step number one. Then the information is gonna be carried in the form of sensory neuron to the dorsal root ganglion in the, in the spinal cord. So that's your afferent fiber. Um, and then you're gonna have little interneuron that is going to carry this information to, uh, in the spinal cord in the gray matter to the uh, ventral root and your efferent nerve is going to arise from here. At, this, uh, at the same time, uh, information, the same information is going to be carried to, to, the, uh, to the brain through a um, spinal thalamic tract or, or a sensory tract where uh, the brain is being informed that here there is something happening down here in the body. And the ventral root is going to, uh, to command through step four to the motor neuron and then finally the muscle is going to contract in response to uh, to the stimulus. So this is how the reflex arc is built and you can see that this reflex arc does not involve really, it does not have to have the central nervous system input. So even if you didn't have any connection here and the central nervous system was disconnected, uh, a patient will still have activation of the, uh, the reflex. So that you may still see some contraction uh, in a uh, paralyzed patient or in a patient who has central nervous lesion and there is no connection to the brain. Uh, hypothetically speaking. So let's move on to, the, after reviewing this reflex arc, we move on to, uh, to different levels of uh, paralysis or different levels of lesion. So what can happen? So first I'll talk about peripheral nervous system. So you can see that you have muscle fiber, uh, which is getting some signal from the nerve, the, and nerve is formed of the peripheral nerve, and you have the sensory and the motor uh, 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 parts of the peripheral nerve, and then uh, here you are, you have the ventral and the dorsal root which are carrying the motor and the sensory supply respectively from the spinal cord. So where can be the, where can you have the lesion? So if there is a disconnection, uh, there is a disconnect or there is a damage at any of these levels, you will have a problem. So for example, there can be uh, a myopathy or there can be a neuromuscular junction problem. So the lesion can be right here in the case of myasthenia gravis, then there can be a peripheral neuropathy. So there can be damage in the peripheral nerve. The entire nerve may have a problem. So then there will be both motor and sensory loss. And then there can be a problem in the anterior or the ventral root uh, or the anterior horn cell. So in this case, only the motor problem, motor uh, uh, the deficit will be present and the sensory will be intact. So uh, just putting a little more detail on it, so uh, we have the neuromuscular junction disease here. So myasthenia gravis will be a condition where the patient is gonna have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. So although the, operator, although the machine and the apparatus will be all normal and the patient will have a normal signal from the nerve, but because that junction is uh, damaged, uh, the contraction will not happen. So the patient will have weakness because of this. Next move on to the uh, anterior horn cell. So there are uh, some problem, m m multiple problems where the anterior horn cell can be uh, damaged. So one uh, great example is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's a very unfortunate condition where the patient has, has motor weakness. Sensory is intact because it's only on the anterior side and the patient gradually goes on to develop uh, paralysis all over the body and these patients unfortunately don't do very well. The next would be uh, peripheral neuropathy. So if there is a lesion in the entire nerve, uh, you may see numbness, tingling, weakness in the distribution of the nerve. So peripheral neuropathies can be polyneuropathies or mononeuropathies. Polyneuropathies are very, uh, generally they are very vague and there are multiple things can, that can cause polyneuropathies and generally speaking they are very distal. So that's why you have a lot of feet and hands here. 
but anyhow there is a little mnemonic that i made here for you to remember so you can remember mad wig dt and i'm sure you probably have better mnemonics than this so mad wig dt uh, stands for metabolic problem uh, which is the most common problem uh, causing peripheral neuropathy so diabetes uh, 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 thyroid problems can cause uh, peripheral neuropathies alcohol intoxication drug use or um, even prescription medications can cause neuropathies then there are vitamin deficiencies for example b12 and b1 infections for example lyme disease is very common the uh, polio, HIV, and all these things can cause peripheral neuropathies. Then Gambare syndrome is a very dramatic form of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, trauma uh, to any nerve can cause in the, uh, a, a, an isolated uh, or polyneuropathy. And then uh, some toxic causes can also cause peripheral neuropathies. Then there are some examples of mononeuropathies. The two most common mononeuropathies in the body are carpal tunnel syndrome where you can see here the uh, there is uh, numbness tingling and weakness in the distribution of median nerve in the in the carpal tunnel uh, that is very common and then you also can see numbness weakness and a lot of pain in the distribution of uh, sciatic nerve in the case of lumbar radiculopathy so in all these cases you will of course do your sensory exam and your motor exam and check the strength and the uh, reflexes and the tone and the bulk so and then there are some specific exams you can do for example in the case of carpal tunnel syndrome you can do um, phelan test and also the tunnel test in the case of uh, sciatic nerve you can do straight leg raise test next we move on to the lesion at the level of spinal cord so uh, just as a review i have a section of the spinal cord so you can see that we uh, you have this light, this nice uh, gray matter and the white matter, and then you have different spinal tracts. So this is a cross section. So here you can see lateral and anterior corticospinal tracts. These are carrying information from the brain to the spinal cord, and these so these are your motor fibers that are uh, going to the spinal cord and then to the muscle to make the. These are command neurons basically, so they make us move. Then there is sensory information being carried from the dorsal column. So this is position and vibration and fine touch sensation being carried from the posterior column or the dorsal column all the way to uh, the sensory cortex. Then you have the spinothalamic tract uh, which carries information of pain and temperature and crude touch uh, all the way up to the thalamus and then the sensory cortex. And all these and remember all these tracts uh, decussate or change or change or cross over to the other side at some level and we'll go into that in a second here. But this is what the cross section is. So depending upon where the lesion is, you can have a damage to the motor, the sensory, the dorsal, or the or the spinothalamic tracts. Uh, 